Let's pray together this morning. Father, we're thankful today and grateful today that we are no longer bound by sin and darkness, but you have set us free in the power of the blood of your son, Jesus the Christ. Father, we gather together today as your people in your house to hear a word from you. Father, would you grant us the freedom for just these few moments to separate ourselves from our burdens, separate ourselves from our worries, separate ourselves from the cares of this world so that we can just focus on you, focus on Jesus. Father, in these moments today as we study your revelation of yourself to us, we pray that you would help us in our own lives today to determine, to be reminded of what is most important in our lives. Father, help us today in the words of your Son to seek first your kingdom and your righteousness in our lives, knowing then that all of these other things that we worry about, all of these other things that cause us anxiety, they'll be added unto us. Father, you are Lord and you are King. We proclaim you today our Master. And we want to humble ourselves in your presence and bow our knee to you today, Father, and follow you. Lead us and guide us, Father, and give us the boldness and the courage and the knowledge and the discernment to walk as you lead. And all God's people said, amen and amen. And you may be seated this morning as you're turning to the book of Philippians as we continue this message series from this great letter, from this great epistle in the New Testament. Well, it's January 12th. This is about the time, you know, about 10 days or 11 or 12 days into January that those New Year's resolutions sort of really get serious, right? This is when the rubber uh, hits the road in terms of those New Year's resolutions and we really determine and decide what we're made of, see what we're made of, whether we're going to hold to those resolutions or, or not. Uh, my my resolution this year was to, you know, I don't know what it is in the holiday season. I don't know. You're just happy and you're joyful and you lose your mind for a few minutes and you just think, yeah, I can do that. No problem. So I decided rather than reading the Bible through in a year, which I've done before, there are other programs out there where you can read the Bible through in 90 days. I'm a pastor. I should do that, right? Well, praise God, I'm still with it, but I'm telling you, the rubber's hitting the road. You hear what I'm saying? <laughs> it takes about 45 minutes a day, but it's good, right? I mean, it's the time when the rubber hits the road. Somebody sent me this last week. This is where I'm going with this. Somebody sent me this last week. Uh, some comments about people in their New Year's resolutions. Some things people are saying about their New Year's resolutions. One person said, low-carb diets work. Not because they are healthier, but because without carbohydrates, I simply lose the will to eat, right? <laughs> uh, and we might say, you know, in Louisiana, without carbohydrates, we simply lose the will to live, right? Somebody said, I would, uh, my New Year's resolution is this. Here, it's based on this thought. I would like to stop looking like I'm wearing a bulletproof vest all the time. <laughs> I can identify with that. Somebody said, uh, you know, my New Year's resolution is to go to the gym, and I've discovered this. My favorite thing to do at the gym every day is to leave, <laughs> and that, that's true. Somebody said, a gym is just a PE class that you pay to skip. Well, I thought, you know, that's, that, that's true. Uh, somebody else said, I'm on a strict running program. That's my New Year's resolution. I'm on a strict running program. I started yesterday, and the good news is, that so far, I've only missed one day. <laughs> That's kind of the way, that's kind of the way I feel. Well, the book of Philippians, and we're still in chapter one, we're still in the in the introduction to the book of Philippians. And thus far, uh, we summarized last week's message by saying this: the Christians at Philippi were different. It's obvious from a reading, even of just the first few verses of this letter, that the Christians at Philippi were somehow different. There was something special about 
that church, and listen, what that means is this. When you hear, hey, there's something special about that church, or hey, that's a good church, here's what that means. There's something special about the people in that church. There's something special about the members of that church because the church is the people. First Baptist Church of Ponchatoula is not this building, it's not this property, it's not our budget, it's not our, our buildings, it's not our programs, it's you and it's me. And so when we say there's something special about the church at Philippi, we're saying there's something special about those Christians, those believers at Philippi Church. And the reason that Philippi Church was special, the reason that those Christians at Philippi were special, we're going to discover uh, today. So beginning in verse 6, one of my favorite verses from the book of Philippians is Philippians 1, 6. And you'll probably be surprised as we go through the book of Philippians how many favorite verses you have in the book of Philippians because it's full of those wonderful verses. But here it is, verse 6, beginning reading there uh, this morning. Paul says to the Christians at Philippi, I am sure of this, that he who started a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. It is right for me to think this way about all of you because I have you in my heart. And you are all partners with me in grace, both in my imprisonment and in the defense and establishment of the gospel. For God is my witness how deeply I miss all of you with the affection of Christ Jesus. And I pray this, that your love will keep on growing in knowledge and every kind of discernment so that you can determine what really matters and can be pure and blameless in the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. The reason Philippi Church was different was because they were full Christians. Uh, they were full of the Holy Spirit. They were full of the Lord. And that's why I've titled this series Joyful, not spelling joyful in the normal way that it's spelled, but emphasizing that word full, because the believers at Philippi Church were full, and that's what set them apart. That's what made them different. They were full of the Lord. They were full for one simple reason. God was simply at work in that church, meaning again that God was at work in the believers in that church. That church was comprised of followers of the Lord Jesus Christ who were allowing God to work in their lives. And he, he, listen, when we allow him to work, he does not disappoint. When we invite God to work, you know, and as the old saying goes, when we crawl ourselves up on the operating table of God, he will perform surgery and he will work and he will move in our hearts and in our lives and he will transform us and he'll make us different. They were full because God was at work in them. And what that really means is that God was working in each and every member of the church, in all the believers gathered there, and they were being filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ, as verse 11 says, to the glory and praise of God. In other words, the church at Philippi was not playing church, they were not fake Christians. This was not a pretend church. And they were not gathered there for the show. This was the real deal. And this is my simple desire for us as a church family. Just simply this, that God be at work among us. Wherever we are, wherever we have been, wherever we are going, I just pray that God is at work in us. Because I know that if God is at work in us, then God is going to be at work in our church and everything's going to be all right. I'm sure of that. I just pray that we be in the process of being filled with the righteousness of the Lord Jesus Christ. My chief desire, my number one desire, my first and foremost desire, and, and hear me through on this, is not that we have the largest church. That's not my first desire. That is a desire of mine, but it's not my first desire. My chief desire is not that we have the nicest buildings, and so far we're doing really good on that. My chief desire is not that we have the best program, programming or the largest budget. Because listen carefully here. You can have the largest church and you can have the nicest buildings and you can have the biggest budgets and you can have the premier programs and have not one ounce of spiritual transformation taking place. 
However, if you focus on the transformation, if you focus on the work of God, if you focus on the spiritual, an amazing thing happens. God gives you that spiritual growth. And God gives you that transformation. And he leads you in that transformation. And he gives you all of that other stuff as well. The numerical growth comes. And of course the buildings come and the programming comes. And the giving comes. Why? Because you take care of first things first. The old saying goes, you take care of the kingdom of God and the kingdom of God will take care of you. All of those other things fall into order. Call it the organic theory of church growth. I love that word organic. Call it, you can call it the bonsai theory of church growth. If you take care of the roots of that plant, if you take care of what's below ground, listen, the tree will grow. And the tree will be beautiful. And the tree will be strong. Focus on what matters most. And the things that don't matter most will take care of themselves. And that seems to be the case with the church at Philippi. They were not perfect. They were not the richest people. They were not the best looking people. They were just full, confident Christians. And Paul says it in verse 6. He says, I am sure of this. Meaning, I am convinced of this. Meaning, I am, I am persuaded, some translations say. I'm persuaded of this. Meaning, listen, I have weighed all of the evidence. I have seen everything that's going on. And, and I've weighed it. And this I believe with all of my heart. So, you might want to underline that phrase in verse 6. I am sure of this. Listen, that is the assurance of salvation. That is the assurance of being a follower of Christ. I am sure of this. Assurance of salvation. When we're sure and confident and persuaded that we are in Christ Jesus in the word of Paul writing to the church at Philippi. Listen, that kind of assurance brings humility and it brings joy and it brings praise to the glory of God. And it's the kind of believers we all need to be. It's the kind of church we need to be. Sure in our faith. Listen, convinced that Jesus is the answer. Persuaded that there is no better life anywhere than the life to be had in following the Lord Jesus Christ. So can we just be confident, sure, persuaded Christians? Certainly not arrogant, in no way perfect, not holier than thou, not hypocritical, but just sure of our faith, sure that we have found him, sure that we have found the way, and, and living that confident faith for others to see. Is God at work in your life? Here's some other questions that I think come to mind immediately when we ask that question. Is God at work in your life? Well, if he's not at work in your life, who is? Who is molding you? Who is shaping you? Who is teaching you? I think the answer to those questions in regard to the believers at Philippi is the Lord Jesus Christ is molding us. God is shaping us. The Holy Spirit is teaching us and empowering us. And that's what made them different. They were just a genuine church. They were just genuine believers in Christ. God was just working in them. Listen, if God is not at work in you today, then why not? Why not? Philippians paints a picture of believers who were just experiencing the natural work of God in their lives. The Old Testament paints that picture as, as a potter and the clay. He is the potter, we are the clay, and he's working. And if he's not working in his church, then there's a problem. The Christians at Philippi were growing in what matters most. Verse 10 uses that phrase so that you can determine what really matters. They knew what really mattered. We know what really matters in our heart of hearts. They were growing in what matters most. They were growing in their faith. 
they were growing in their relationship to the Lord Jesus Christ. They were growing in their walk with the Lord. And that brings confidence in life. And it brings surety in life. It brings joy in life. It brings fullness in life. And so Paul, still in the introduction now, he writes to them and he says, I am sure of this. And we can be sure of this today. We need to be sure of this today. Listen, in your life, be sure that God started a good work in you. We need to be sure today that God has started a good work in us. And if we are Christians, if we are in Christ Jesus, then God has started a good work in us. This is in verse 6. And this is past tense. God started at some point in the past a work in you. This letter was written to those who were already Christians, those who were already in Christ Jesus, and they were gathered together in Philippi. So at some point, God started something in the Philippian Christians. That's past tense. We said last week, there were not always Christians in Philippi. There was not always a church in Philippi. But at some point, previous to the moment that Paul wrote this letter, God started a good work in them. Something that God had already done. And this beginning work, the start of this work, the spark of this work, the genesis of this work, the impetus of this work, whatever word you want to use there, this start is God's grace. It's God's grace to us. Paul says it right there in verse 7. And you all, all of you in Philippi, all of you in the church there, you all are partners with me. And you think, what is he going to say there? Partners in what? Well, you think, oh, you're, you're business partners with me. Or, or you're, you're friends with me. No, you're partners with me in grace. We share the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ together. And it is that grace that starts a good work in us. The beginning work is God's grace to us. What has been started in you and in me is an act of grace. It's an act of God's grace. So if you are a believer, you have received the grace of Jesus and you have received his offer of salvation and his offer of forgiveness. And listen, Paul is saying here that's something that happened in the past, but listen, that is not the end of the story. It's not just a one-time thing. It's not just a one-moment thing. It's not something that is once and done. Salvation is not. Paul says, but that was the start of the good work in you. And one of the most fundamental misunderstandings of Christianity in the world today, I believe, is that being a Christian is just about one moment. It's just about that initial start of the gospel in our lives. Listen, being a Christian is not a once and done thing. Yes, there is a starting point. And yes, if it's a true starting point, you never lose your salvation. But the journey of salvation is not a once and done thing. It is a journey. It is a process. As we will see as we continue in this message this morning. God started a good work and it's just the beginning. It's just the beginning of a good work that the Lord wishes to do in our lives. Now the good news for us when we think about this work that God wants to do in us, when we think about the shaping and the molding that he wants to accomplish in our hearts and lives, the good news is that it is his work. And I'm grateful that transformation is his work. I'm grateful that it's up to him. It is not up to us to transform ourselves. The work of Christian growth in us is the work of God. It is not our work any more than salvation is our work. If it was our work, then we would be responsible for it and we would be in trouble. But it's his work. He's responsible for it. The only thing we do is remain open to his formation and his shaping and his leadership. The only thing we do is make ourselves available for his working in us. The only thing we do is crawl ourselves up on the operating table so that he can perform surgery on us. It's his work. 
Paul says to the believers in Philippi, God started a good work in you. Notice that it's a good work. I'm not sure that we're always convinced that the work that God wants to do in us is a good work. But it is a good work. It is the best work. The work that God wants to wrought in us is good. Want good in your life? Want what is best in your life? Then let God work in you. And you'll experience good. You'll experience the best life that you can ever hope to experience. The good work of salvation and the good work of sanctification that God wants to do in us is based on His goodness. And it is good. It is exactly what we need. It is the life to live. And it brings joy and it brings fullness into our lives. Pastor Kent Hughes wrote, as I reflect on my 50 plus years in Christ, it is indeed God who has kept me. It is not my grip on God that has made the difference, but His grip on me. Pastor Kent Hughes said, I am not confident in my goodness. I am not confident in my character. I am not confident in my history. I am not confident even in my reverend persona. I am not confident in my perseverance, but I am confident in God. Paul said, I am sure of this. I'm confident of this. I'm persuaded of this. That God started a good work in you. And he is doing a good work in you. Be sure. No. Be assured. Be confident. Be persuaded that the work that God has started in you is his work. And it is progress and it is work and it's a good work in fact the best work that can ever occur in your life God started a good work and you be sure of that be sure also as a follower of Christ to emulate the example of the Philippians be sure that God is carrying on a good work in us this is present tense he started a good work in the past he is carrying on a good work in us right now I am sure of this, that he who started a good work in you will carry it on, the Holman Christian Standard Bible says. Be sure that God is carrying on some work in you. If you are in Christ, if he began a good work in you in the past, he is present tense carrying on that work, or he is present tense willing to carry on that work. It is God's nature comes to him and us it is God's nature to transform us it is his nature to work in us it is his nature to be a potter it is his nature to form us it is his nature to shape us it is not God's nature to stop forming us it is not God's nature to ever 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 give up on us It is not God's nature to pause his work in us. Listen, he has more work to do in all of us. There is no way that God cannot carry on work in you. There is no way that God cannot transform you further. Or at least there's no way that God does not desire to carry on that kind of work in us. If the work of God is not carrying on in us, then it's because we have stopped it, or we have paused it, or or we have been afraid of where he might be leading us, or because we have built up some kind of barriers to stop his work in us. It is not because he has no work to do in us. If you are, if you are, we can say it this way. Same thing said in a different way. If you are in Christ Jesus, there'll be some evidence that God is at work. There'll be some fruit. There'll be some measure of quality to your faith. Salvation is no excuse for laziness when it comes to transformation. How is God carrying on his work? What is the work that God wants to carry on in us? Well, at least some of the answer can be found right there in verse 9 in the prayer that Paul offers for the Christians at Philippi. And I pray this, he said, that your love will keep growing. There's a way that God wants to carry on a good work in us. He he wants to see in us love that is growing. That our love for the Lord Jesus Christ grows over time. 
and I think it does. I think the older we get and the more mature we get, the more we understand the Word of God, the more we understand the Christian faith, the more amazed we are in the presence of Jesus the Nazarene, and the more we love Him because of what He's done for us. Paul says, I pray this, that your love will just keep on growing. And then he says, in knowledge. And so another way that God wants to carry on good work in us is by increasing our knowledge. This was going on at the church in Philippi. Their love for the Lord Jesus Christ was growing and they were increasing in knowledge. Can I be honest for just a few minutes here about the modern church? Over the last few decades, I'm afraid we haven't done so well in letter B. In increasing the knowledge of God and increasing the knowledge of His Word. I'm afraid we have been in a situation where we have been so concerned about being nice and so concerned about our image that sometimes we have backed away from offering opportunities for increasing knowledge in the hearts and lives of our members. And so there have been churches and there have been church leaders out there that weren't really teaching a whole lot. You know the kinds of issues that I'm talking about here, the kinds of ministries that I'm talking about here, the kinds of ministries whereby you're not going to learn one thing from them. You might have a good time. You might have an emotional boost. You might leave feeling good about yourself when you should leave feeling good about the Lord Jesus Christ. But as far as gaining knowledge, as far as building the storehouse of truth in your life, no, you're just not going to do that. We've not done very good over the last few decades in the church of increasing the knowledge of our people and and growing in the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ and the knowledge of His Word. Listen, there, there is, there, think about it this way, there is a treasure chest of truth in you. There's a treasure chest of truth in your heart. And every time you discover something that is true, it goes in that treasure chest. And you're like me, you know the truth when you hear it. You have those aha moments like I do and you come to new discoveries and and you come to receive new revelations from the Lord about His truth and about His Word. And you say, aha, I've never thought about that before, but I get it. Now, that's a piece of truth. And you take it and you put it in that chest. Truth rings the bell of truth and you know it and you hide it in that chest. Let me tell you a little bit about this treasure chest of truth that you have in your heart and in your mind and in your spirit and I have in my heart and in my mind and in my spirit some things that might blow your mind about this truth that's in your life. Listen, everything you put in that chest, every piece of truth you put in the treasure chest of truth in your life, it's all God's truth. Every single fact of it. All truth is God's truth. And that does not just apply to spiritual truth that you gain from the Word of God. It does not just apply to moral truth that you may get from the Scriptures, but it applies even to things like geometry. If it's a geometric truth, it's God's truth. Why? Because He created everything that is, including geometry. Oh, Lord, why? But He did. All truth is God's truth. Because the Bible says He is the truth. Also know that your treasure, sometimes we're afraid of this treasure chest. We're afraid that somehow it's going to get full and we're not going to be able to get any more truth in it. And so we might back off from trying to gain knowledge for a while. Well, you know, I've learned about all I can. My treasure chest is pretty full and I don't want the thing to fill totally up. So I'm just going to back off from taking on knowledge for a while. I'm going back off from learning for a while. Listen, your treasure chest of truth will never be completely filled up so that you don't have room for more truth. Don't worry about it. It's not going to happen. Know also that there is an infinite supply of truth to go in your treasure chest of truth. There's an infinite supply of it. Why? Because God is infinite. You'll never gain all of his truth or all of his knowledge. And it is the continuous work of God to take his infinite truth and put it in your treasure chest of truth. Now, some of us have that treasure chest closed pretty tight. 
Some of us, you know, it takes a lot for God to stretch open the lid of that thing and shove truth in there. What I'm trying to say is some of us are stubborn, and it's hard for us to learn, and we don't always get it the first time. But listen, go ahead and try to open that chest up and let God fill it up for you. Go ahead and take on more knowledge. Paul said to the church at Philippi, I pray this, that your love will keep on growing in knowledge. Take on some more knowledge. It's God's continuous work to transfer his truth to us. God is working truth in us. And sometimes it does take work on his part to get it in there. Our completely full God is filling us with himself. Our completely full Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, is filling us with himself. The church at Philippi was full. They were being filled with the fullness of Christ. Our completely full God is filling us with Jesus who is the truth. And so go where the truth leads you. Go where you are taught the truth. Go where you discover fresh truth. Paul says, I pray that your love will grow. It's a work that God wants to carry on in our lives. He says, I pray you'll increase in knowledge. I pray you'll increase in discernment. i got to pick up speed here. I don't have a whole lot of time to spend here, but... We'll talk about discernment later in this message series. But Paul says, I, I, I pray this, verse 9, that you'll keep on growing in knowledge and every kind of discernment. What in the world is discernment? Well, discernment is truth that we take and put to work in our lives. So it's taking that truth that God pours into us. It's taking the truth of his word and us applying it to the situations and circumstances of our lives. Discernment is truth applied to the specific circumstances of our lives. Discernment is working out the truth that God works in us. Now, when I say working it out, I don't mean working it out to get rid of it. I just mean exercising it, using the truth that God is putting in us. Discernment is working out the truth that God works in. Christian, work out what God works in you. I don't want to get ahead of us in this series, but 2.13 says this, for it is God who is working in you. There it is again. It is God who is working in you, enabling you both to will and to act for his good purpose. So work it out. Work out the truth that God works in you. God started a good work in us. God is carrying on a good work. And know this, Paul says, I am sure, I am sure, I know, I'm persuaded, I'm convinced that God will complete a good work in us. What God starts, he completes. This is future tense. He started a work in the past. He is carrying it on in the present. And he will complete it in the future. Be sure that God will complete his work in you. This goes along with what is said in verse 10. So that, verse 10 begins, that's future. So that, so that you can determine the Holman Christian Standard Bible says what really matters. Determine what really matters. Another translation says this, and I, I like this translation, so that you can approve the things that are superior. God is working in us. He is carrying on his work in us so that we can know what is the good life. So that we can know what really matters. So that we can know what is superior in our lives. So that we can know what to grasp onto. This is the good life. This is the best life. So that you can approve the things that are superior, verse 10. So that you can be pure and blameless in the day of Christ, verse 10. So that you can stand before God pure and blameless. So that you can stand before God on judgment day. And when God looks at you, he'll see not you and your work, but he will see his son and his work in you, his transforming work in you, so that you can, verse 10, be filled with the fruit of righteousness. And there is that concept again of fullness. Filled with the fruit of righteousness. So that brings us to the end of the introduction to this great letter of the Apostle Paul to the Christians at the church in Philippi. And in this introduction, in this opening, Paul has introduced the great themes already of this great book. Thankfulness, joy, assurance, affection. But even at the moment Paul wrote these words, even at the moment he is penning this great message under the leadership and inspiration of God's Holy Spirit, his skin is streaked 
and chained. From being chained to a Roman guard in prison. Notice the contrast. And this is what Paul is saying to the believers at Philippi. This is what made them special. They were filled on the inside. We see this repeatedly in this great book. They were filled on the inside. So they didn't care so much what happened to them on the outside. It didn't matter to them. Paul was chained to a Roman guard in prison. He mentions his imprisonment in verse 7. But his heart was full, running over. Somebody said he was, even in that state, even in that condition, he was the happiest man in Rome. Why? Because he enjoyed imprisonment? I don't think so. Why? Because he enjoyed the uh, physical abuse that he endured in prison? I doubt it. Why? Because he was full on the inside. He was full of Christ. By the world's standards, he should have been miserable. But he wasn't. What can rob us of that kind of joy? Well, if you are without Christ, I promise you, you won't find that kind of joy. If you are prayerless, and ungrateful, you won't find that kind of joy. If you don't have some kind of partnership in the gospel, you won't find that kind of joy. If you don't have assurance, if you're not sure of the Lord and His work in you, if you're not sure of this, in the words of verse 6, you won't have that kind of joy. If you don't have affectionate relationships as Paul had with the church at Philippi, you won't have that kind of joy. So let us look to Jesus, who endured the cross, bearing our sin, bearing our punishment, so that we might be reconciled to God, to the glory and praise of God forever. I'm sure of this, believer, I'm sure of this, friend, that he who started a good work in you, will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. Would you stand with me as we pray together this morning? Father, we thank you for this wonderful promise found in your word. And we thank you for your transformative work in our lives. Oh God, continue to work in us. Do not stop your work. Do not give up on us. Continue to move and shape and form. Father, help us to be faithful to your process and to present ourselves in your presence so that you can work in us and move in us. Lead us and guide us today, Father, in this time of invitation and decision. In Jesus' name, amen. Staff and counselors will be here at the front if you'd like someone to pray with you. You can come to trust the Lord today. You can come to join this church family. You can come to simply kneel at the altar. Whatever your need today, would you respond as we sing together?